Thank you for the invitation and uh, for the title, which I didn't choose, because the title has some implications that are uh, so far to what I know uh, very difficult to to address. Because uh, in pre-symptomatic vulnerable patients, it means patients that did not have coronary disease before. So it's pri talking about primary prevention. And uh, in this term, uh, there is nothing that I know that can tell whether one patient uh, will be a different type from another in terms of, of what is described by traditional risk factors. So uh, I'm a clinician. I'm used to see patients. I still see patients. I, I still keep being surprised by how patients present to me. And I try to learn from what they are trying to teach me. Not necessarily succeed, but I try. So, uh, so you see, one of the problems that we are confronted when we have uh, uh, use risk stratification, and we here I put the Framingham score plus the CRP or uh, LDL cholesterol plus CRP from this uh, review from Paul Ritke. Uh, we are uh, faced from uh, uh, we are facing the fact that we see a very remarkable strat stratification of risk from these patients with low CRP and low Framingham score, it's about 1% uh, risk in 10 years, to these two with high CRP and high Framingham score that's more than 20%. However, there are two points that to a clinician are very embarrassing. The first is that uh, these that had events in 10 years, there was, no, there was no way that I could predict who was going to have it within one month or within one year, or within nine years, or within ten. The second is that after all what I've done here, about 80% of patients in ten years have absolutely nothing, which is remarkable. If you think that these are the highest risk that they can stratify. So you see the problem is that in these patients if we have anything, it will be difficult to identify those that are at risk in this low risk group because of the, ba um, the Bayesian theory, and it's very difficult to identify those at risk. So we can hope to identify here some of these that are at greater risk. And now how are we going to do it? Uh, you heard before that some of these people that get the first heart attack don't have critical stenosis. So if we had the coronary angiogram the day before, we could not have predicted that they were going to have a heart attack. Now if we can find plaques uh, that are going to become unstable, and that is a problem because we have difficulties in distinguishing uh, a number of things when we see something. We have difficulties in defining what is a mountain which will never erupt, and what is a volcano that sometimes may erupt. And uh, we only are good at identifying volcanoes when they are erupting because we see them. They have thrombus on top, they create trouble, they have symptoms for the patient most of the time. Uh, but if they don't erupt, and they erupted in the past, then it becomes difficult again. It's uh, like recognizing some volcano which has erupted 100 years ago or 500 years ago, and we don't know what's going to do next. So we have a difficult problem. However, if we uh, try to learn from what pa patients try to tell us, maybe we can uh, very humbly take a new tack you know, change the sails according to the wind. And uh, the problem is we are talking about ateroma and atherosclerosis and identify the total atherosclerotic risk. Well, I'm impressed as a, as a physician that some patients have a lot of ateroma and yet they didn't have an infarction and others have very little ateroma and they had an infarction. But I'm even more impressed by the fact that some patients have a, an infarction have their ateroma, and then for years and years have absolutely nothing with the same ateroma staying there, the same atherotic burden. So I think that on average we go on what we always learn, but if we want to move ahead we have to start thinking along different lines and try to understand what triggers an acute coronary syndrome, unstable angina, heart attack, 
if this is not linearly related with ataroma, because it's not. At least all clinicians know it's not. On average, yes, but in, 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 in clinical practice it's not. So, in other conditions, subtle difference in clinical presentation and phenotypic features may provide clues suggestive of specific causes of clinical syndrome. In anemic patients, clinical history and red cell features can provide useful information on specific causes of anemia, which you wouldn't have if you only measure hemoglobin. And we do this most of the time with patients with ischemic heart disease because in epidemiology we only measure heart, heart attacks or coronary death. When we do angiography, we measure stenosis, but it's only one thing. And I, and I ask myself, could this be the case also for patients presenting with acute coronary syndromes? And uh, always listening to patients, this could be the case because there is a spectrum of clinical presentations for patients that come in with acute coronary syndrome or heart attacks. At one extreme, you must have seen patients like this, that the patient presents with an infarction out of the blue out of the blue sky, preceded and followed by complete stability. If the patient denies having had anything before, you can always say that the patient doesn't know, that he's stupid because he doesn't tell me what the books are telling me that he should teach me. But that's not the case. And it's followed by complete stability. The patient may not have anything for the next 10 years, 20 years. At the other extreme end of the spectrum of presentations, you have this other patient, type 2. The patient has unstable angina, followed by infarction, and followed by recurrent acute coronary syndrome, post-infarction angina, new infarction. And you must have seen these patients. And you know unstable angina uh, is defined, angina is defined unstable if it happens up to two months before admission, and then can remain unstable for a few months later. And if you look at the Duke database, uh, you see that mortality following infarction or acute uh, or unstable angina uh, decreases gradually following discharge for the first six months and reaches that of stable patients only after six months. So there is a transient, prolonged period of instability in patients that had, that had, a, uh, that had an acute coronary syndrome. But is this uh, period of instability equally affecting all the patients, both type 1 and type 2? Well, it does not appear to be like that because these patients, type 1 and type 2, appear to have also some biological difference, not only clinical difference of presentation, but also some biological differences. Here, for example, if you look at patients, of course patients have to be very well characterized. These are patients with brown world class 3B unstable angina. 65% of these patients have elevated levels of CRP. But of course, it's patients with persisting unstable angina, like in Brown World Classification 3B. Now, a complement to this is that patients that have an infarction, but the infarction was preceded by unstable angina, it practically 100% had levels of CRP on admission higher than 3 million per liter. But if you compare patients that had infarction not preceded by unstable angina, only 45% had elevated values of CRP and interleukin-6 on admission. And this uh, was published by, in this paper with Giovanna Riuzzo in 94 on the New England and repeated by, in another study published on JAK in 99. So it looks like a majority of patients with persisting unstable angina have elevated C-reactive protein independently from having uh, elevated troponin because those patients were excluded. So this was the first study where CRP was shown to be associated with persistent instability and infarction independently from elevated, CRP, ele elevated markers of necrosis because we excluded all the patients with elevated troponin. And by com conversely, all the patients that in, in whom infarction was perceived by unstable angina had elevated CRP on admission within six hours, whereas only 45% of patients presenting with an infarction just out of the blue, not preceded by unstable angina, had elevated CRP. But the story goes on. Here, persisting CRP elevation post-discharge predicts recurrent instability. This is the paper we published with Luigi Biasucci on Circulation 99. And this is a similar paper in a follow-up study 
by Peter Bogarty in, in Canada, he published on circulation in 201. So these patients that had tended to have recurrent events tend to have elevated uh, inflammatory markers, CRP or interleukin-6. And this is the paper by Biasucci. You see that on admission, patient with Brown-Well class 3B, 70% had elevated CRP, but not 100. So patients are not behaving homogeneously because probably they are not homogeneous. Uh, at discharge, 50% nearly have elevated CRP. At three months, over 40%. At one year, nearly 40% continue to have elevated CRP and interleukin-6. Now, these are patients with low levels of discharge, lower than 3 milligrams, and these are with levels higher than 3 milligrams. You see these, uh, the event-free survival is markedly uh, better in those with low CRP. So these patients presenting with low CRP with unstable angina have smaller incidence of events uh, than those that have elevated CRP. And here, there are two interesting studies that says that those patients uh, that have, uh, that have uh, a primary angioplasty for infarction, the paper by Goldstein in New England, and have multiple unstable coronary plaques, those that had multiple plaques were more likely to come back within short time with a new infarction or new unstable angina. So multiple plaques in the study by Goldstein were associated with recurrent instability. Here in the paper by Zairis, on atherosclerosis, the higher number of the unstable plaques were correlated with higher levels of CRP. And in this paper that we published with Antonino Buffon in the New England uh, in 2002, that paper showed that there is widespread inflammation in patients that have unstable angina and brown world class 3B, uh, unstable angina. So that's not only the case, but this is a paper that has been uh, just submitted, has been presented last year by Antonella Lombardo from our group, that shows that carotid plaques are more often complex in patients that have unstable angina and elevated CRP than simple plaques. In patients with low CRP, carotid plaques are more often simple, uh, are no plaques or simple plaques, and very seldom in stable pa in patients with low CRP there are complicated plaques by echo, cardio by echo uh, in, in unstable, in unstable patients with low CRP. So it looks like there is, in those patients that have persistent recurrent instability, have multiple plaques in the coronaries, how can you identify which one will become the culprit lesion next time, which one should be, stand, be standard? Not only, but it looks like they have complex plaques also in the carotid. So it's a systemic problem. But you see, it's a systemic problem that doesn't last forever. It's not related to atheroma because eventually, after three months, after six months, after two weeks, after one year, then it dies down. Yet the atheroma remains there. But this is like a storm that happens in these patients and uh, is related or associated with this systemic inflammatory uh, detectable things. I don't know whether this is related causally to CRP or that is just a marker of something. It's most likely, in my opinion, a marker. So the mechanism of inflammation in these, during these acute coronary syndromes uh, could be infections and non-infectious agents, bacteria, viruses, oxidants, toxins, immunological stimuli, as shown in these papers that we published with Giovanna Liuzzo in circulation, 99-2000, with Pina Caligiuri and Goran Hansen in 2000, with Gigi Biasucci in circulation, 203, where we found antibodies against heat shock protein 60 of chlamydia in, acute, in patients with acute coronary syndromes, but not in stable patients. And then uh, what is common in this group of patients that have elevated CRP, persistent elevated CRP, persistent elevated interleukin-6, is that they have enhanced inflammatory responsiveness to stimuli in vivo like uh, uh, coronary arteriography, uh, the stimulus of catheterization, or angioplasty in this paper with Giovanna Liuzzo, or to the stimulus of myocardial necrosis for uh, the same paper, uh, the same with Giovanna Liuzzo. Uh, and here with, uh, um, in, in um, 
monocytes uh, ex vivo that they respond to lipopolysaccharide by producing much more interle interleukin-6 than the monocytes of patients which, who do not have elevated CRP and interleukin-6. So, in conclusion, in acute carnitine syndromes, inflammatory response is largely independent from the global atherothrombotic burden. In some patients, but not in all, plaque instability may be prolonged in time and involve multiple vascular sites. So, you see, if we have to deal with this problem from a different angle, what do we need to do? We need to learn more. We have first to walk and then to run. We are immediately thinking, how are we going to prevent these patients? We cannot prevent them before we understand what's going on. I'm only trying to tell you that there is something that goes on, but it's not necessarily the same in all patients. Inflammatory mechanisms are correlated with recurrence instability. They may be multiple and not equally important in all patients. We have to admit that patients may differ from one from another. The precise identification of these mechanisms is required for target prevention, targeted prevention of inflammation. Otherwise, uh, certainly we cannot give steroids. I wouldn't, personally. Inhibition of key inflammatory final triggers of thrombosis appears an attractive therapeutic target and patients with recurrent instability and elevated inflammatory markers are ideal candidate, candidates for pilot studies. The problem is that if you want to explore the triggers of acute coronary syndrome, clinical investigators should stop being lumpers and become splitters, looking for distinctive rather than for common features among patients presenting with coronary atherosclerosis and acute coronary syndrome. Just to give you an idea, this is an image. And what do you see there? If you look, you know, it's very confusing. But if you look at the extremes, you see clearly a bird. And if you look at the other extreme, it's clearly a fish. In the middle is a mess. But if you don't start looking at the extremes, you will never understand the composition of this picture. And I think that for what causes acute coronary syndrome, in my opinion, it may be more complex than, the, than this picture. Thank you very much.